In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome this evening to our penitential service as we have completed our Palm Sunday celebrations and enter into this more somber atmosphere of our Holy Week. During our Masses today, when we had music, we finished in silence, just as an indicator to ourselves of this transition from the hosannas of Palm Sunday into the preparation to journey with the Lord on his road to Calvary. In the course of the week, there will be some opportunities for confession. I realize that not everybody will be able to take one of those opportunities. And for that reason, I invite you to join in prayer this evening either as a preparation for coming to confession during the week or as an opportunity, as we'll do later on, to try to make a perfect act of contrition. You'll listen to the scriptures this evening and I invite you to open your hearts to the love of God the Father and the forgiveness and mercy that he comes to bring us. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Saviour, and with your spirit. In this Lenten season, Christ calls us to a deeper appreciation of our baptism and to a deeper realisation of our responsibility as followers of Christ to live in accord with the gospel. Too often we have failed to do this. In our sinfulness, we have pursued greed instead of holiness, satisfied individual needs instead of the common good, focused on the famous instead of the outcast, practiced indifference instead of empathy, and listened to countless voices instead of the words of Jesus. This evening, Jesus has called each of us to this sacrament in order to be reminded of how good it is to serve those in need, how right it is to follow the law of the Lord, and how holy it can be to die to self so that others may live. Once again and still he offers us his saving mercy. In this time and in this place and through his church, let us encounter the living God. Brothers and sisters, God calls us to conversion. Let us therefore ask him for the grace of sincere repentance. Father of mercies and God of all consolation, you do not wish the sinner to die, but to be converted and to live. Come to the aid of your people that they may turn from their sins and live for you alone. May we be attentive to your word, confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and always be grateful for your loving kindness. Help us to grow into the fullness of Christ your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Now let's listen to God's word. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The tax collectors and the sinners were all seeking the company of Jesus to hear what he had to say. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained. This man, they said, welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. A man had two sons. 
The younger said to his father, Father, let me have a share of the estate that would come to me. So the father divided the property between them. A few days later, the younger son got together everything he had and left for a distant country where he squandered his money on a life of debauchery. When he had spent it all, that country experienced a severe famine, and now he began to feel the pinch. So he hired himself out to one of the local inhabitants who put him on his farm to feed the pigs. And he would willingly have filled his belly with the husks the pigs were eating, but no one offered him anything. Then he came to his senses and said, How many of my father's paid servants have more food than they want? And here am I dying of hunger. I will leave this place and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your paid servants. So he left the place and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity. He ran to the boy, clasped him in his arms and kissed him tenderly. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the calf we had been fattening and kill it. We are going to have a feast, a celebration, because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was out in the fields, and on his way back, as he drew near the house, he could hear music and dancing. Calling one of the servants, he asked what it was all about. Your brother has come, replied the servant, and your father has killed the calf we had fattened because he has got him back safe and sound. He was angry then and refused to go in, and his father came out to plead with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have slaved for you and never once disobeyed your orders. Yet you never offered me as much as a kid for me to celebrate with my friends. But for this son of yours, when he comes back, after swallowing up your property, he and his women, you kill the calf we had been fattening. The father said, My son, you are with me always, and all I have is yours. But it is only right we should celebrate and rejoice because your brother here was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found.
In many ways, this parable should really be called the parable of the prodigal sons because both sons were lost in a different way. If we think in this parable in the sense of our scriptures that meaning the meaning of lost means not living in a true relationship to our Father in heaven and with ourselves, then the younger son was lost because he thought wealth and the good life and popularity were his source of identity. The older son, on the other hand, thought that duty was his source of identity. And each son in this parable comes to a kind of crisis where there's a point where they realize that these things in which they had pinned their hopes have let them down. After spending everything, a famine brought the young one to his senses. At that point, we're told in the scriptures, he came to his senses, he came to himself, he remembered who he really was. But it was the return of the younger son that was the crisis point for the older because he had failed to see that the riches that his father had were already his. Everything I have is yours, the father said, and that he didn't need to earn them as he thought by dutiful adherence, by working like a servant. I guess we try to place ourselves in this parable in those two different interpretations of his two different sons. Like the younger child, sometimes failing to realize our own worth as God's beloved, because we might be tempted to think our worth is measured by other things, by the popularity of others, by wealth, by success. Or we may fall into the trap of the older brother who thinks that we have to earn God's love constantly by what we do. The most important thing to notice is that in this parable, the parent, the father, never condemns either child. The parent gives each child the freedom to make their own choice and reminds each of them how much they are loved. The word prodigal actually means extravagant, lavish, being very extravagant with money, being wasteful. I guess if there's anybody that's being prodigal in this parable, it's the father who is extravagant and lavish with his love, with his mercy. And it's with that thought that you should dwell a little moment on this image of the prodigal son meeting his father and seeing that love and mercy given to him. Perhaps that's what we should keep in our hearts as we prepare to examine our consciences and to admit our faults and failings to the Lord. The lavishness of the Father's love, the extravagance of his desire to forgive.
Father of mercy, like the prodigal son, I return to you and say, I have sinned against you and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Christ Jesus, Saviour of the world, I pray with the repentant thief to whom you promised paradise. Lord, remember me in your kingdom. Holy Spirit, fountain of love, I call on you with trust. Purify my heart and help me to walk as a child of light. Lord Jesus, you opened the eyes of the blind, healed the sick, forgave the sinful woman, and after Peter's denial, confirmed him in your love. Listen to my prayer, forgive all my sins, renew your love in my heart, help me to live in perfect unity with my brothers and sisters, that I may proclaim your saving power to all the world. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. With that image of the loving Father welcoming back the repentant Son, very firmly in our minds now as we look within ourselves to examine our consciences and present to the Lord our heartfelt sorrow for all our sins. And for our examination of conscience this evening, I thought we would base it on some of the phrases within the confiti or the I confess which we are so familiar with. I confess to Almighty God. Do I sincerely want to be set free from sin and turn again to God? Do I seek a deeper relationship with God in this sacrament of reconciliation? And to you, my brothers and sisters, 
Do I have a genuine love for my family and friends, neighbours, co-workers or fellow students? Have I contributed to the well-being and happiness of others at home? Am I aware of my global relationship to those suffering and dying in other parts of the world? Am I committed to seek peace and promote justice for every person? That I have greatly sinned. Do I blame others for my wrongdoing or for the misfortunes that befall me? Do I accept responsibility for the commitments I have made to others, my spouse, my parents, my children, my parish? Do I accept that society's evils are within my power to influence? In my thoughts and in my words, have I harboured ill thoughts against another person? Have my addictions affected my judgment or behaviour? Have my fears or prejudices prevented me from speaking out on behalf of the poor, the unborn, or people of other races? Have my words caused others hurt? Or has my silence caused others harm? In what I have done, do I seek to be the centre of attention? Have I imposed my will on others without respecting their needs or freedoms? Am I focused on my needs to the detriment of the needs of others? Am I obsessed with having the perfect body, the perfect appearance, making more money, or having the latest technology? Do I need to be in control of all people and all situations? Do I work more than is healthy for my mind or body? And in what I have failed to do, have I neglected my responsibilities to my family? Have I neglected my health? Have I neglect, neglected my prayer life and faith? Do I use the earth's resources wisely? Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, do I recognize my own sins? Does my ego or my self-righteousness prevent me from seeing my own errors? Do I blame broken relationships on others? Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, Ever-Virgin, and all the angels and saints, Do I appreciate the great gift of the Eucharist? Do I worship with my community each and every Sunday when it's possible to do so? Do I reflect often on what God is calling me to do?
and you, my brothers and sisters. Am I so independent that I refuse to ask for help or let others assist me? Do I support and defend other members of my family? Do I give others the opportunity to share their gifts and talents? Do I treat those who wait on me or who work with me with the dignity they deserve as fellow human beings? To pray for me to the Lord our God. Do I promise prayers for people and then not follow through? Do I remember to pray for others in my parish? Do I pray for the living and the dead? The Lord is merciful. He makes us clean of heart and leads us into his freedom when we acknowledge our guilt. Let us ask him to forgive us and bind up the wounds inflicted by our sins. The response to the litany is, Lord, have mercy. You were sent with good news for the poor and healing for the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners, not the just. Lord, have mercy. You forgave the many sins of the woman who showed you great love. Lord, 
have mercy. You did not shun the company of outcasts and sinners. Lord, have mercy. You carried back to the fold the sheep that had strayed. Lord, have mercy. You promised paradise to the repentant thief. Lord, have mercy. You did not condemn the woman taken in adultery, but sent her away in peace. Lord, have mercy. You are always interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Now, in obedience to Christ himself, let us join in prayer to the Father, asking him to forgive us as we forgive others. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Lord, draw near to your servants who, in the presence of your church, confess that they are sinners. Through the ministry of the church, free them from all sin, so that renewed in spirit they may give you thankful praise. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if we were gathered in the church in normal times, it would be the opportunity during a penitential service where perhaps a number of priests would be here in order now to hear our individual confessions. That not being possible just at the moment, I hope that many of you will be able to take up the opportunity in the course of the week to come along and, and receive absolution, to come to confession. But if you're unable, for various reasons, not being able to find a time that you can come, or still nervous of coming out, or still shielding with underlying health issues and being nervous of coming out, then perhaps this would be a moment where we could all attempt to make a perfect act of contrition. A perfect act of contrition is our desire to be reunited with God because of who he is, because of his love for us, and because of sorrow for having offended him on our part, means wanting to live in unity with God and to put aside the sins that stand in our way. There's no set formula for making a perfect act of contrition, and we'll use one such formula in a moment. But there are only two things that are required for us to make this perfect act of contrition. The desire, as I say, to be more closely united with God and to take away the sins that prevent that being be, from being possible. And then a commitment in our minds to go to confession as soon as it is possible for us to do so. This act of perfect contrition brings forgiveness for our sins, but that forgiveness is never separate from the sacrament that we celebrate and the sacramental grace that is only present in an individual confession. So part of our intention, apart from the sorrow for our sins, if we can't manage in the course of this week to come, is at the first opportunity we can to come to confession. So with those two things in mind, a firm commitment to be sorry for our sins and a firm commitment to come to sacramental confession whenever that is possible and as soon as it's possible, then we make our act of contrition. Perhaps finally just being reassured and I hope those who I know would have spent a lifetime wanting to go to confession in preparation for Easter and I've spoken to many who have felt anxious at the prospect they might not be able to get to confession at this time. Perhaps the words of Pope Francis about making this perfect act of contrition are helpful. Because he said, You do what the Catechism says. It is very clear. 
If you cannot find a priest to hear your confession, speak to God, he is your Father, and tell him the truth. But promise him, later I will confess, but forgive me now, and immediately you will return to the grace of God, our Holy Father said. So, with that conviction in our hearts, let us make our act of contrition. My God, I am sorry for my sins with all my heart. In choosing to do wrong and failing to do good, I have sinned against you, whom I should love above all things. I firmly intend, with your help, to do penance, to sin no more, and to avoid whatever leads me to sin. Our Saviour Jesus Christ suffered and died for us. In his name, my God, have mercy. Remember, Lord, your compassion and mercy, which you showed long ago. Do not recall the sins and failings of my youth. In your mercy, remember me, Lord because of your goodness. Let us pray. Lord God, creator and ruler of your kingdom of light, in your great love for this world, you gave up your only Son for our salvation. His cross has redeemed us. His death has given us life. His resurrection has raised us to glory. Through him we ask you to be always present among your family. Teach us to be reverent in the presence of your glory. Fill our hearts with faith, our days with good works, our lives with your love. May your truth be on our lips and your wisdom in all our actions, that we may receive the reward of eternal life. Through Christ our Lord. May the Father bless us, for we are his children born to eternal life. Amen. May the Son show us his saving power, for he died and rose for us. Amen. May the Spirit give us his gift of holiness and lead us by the right path, for he dwells in our hearts. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, Heights of love, what depths of peace when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross says Jesus died, the Ground his body 
precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ,